Hello and welcome to the beautiful mountains of Pu Lung in my partner Luna's home province of Tai Hoa, Vietnam. This weekend I was hoping to put out a big, huge, epic video on ideology. I've been working on it for a couple of months now. I've been teasing it. I really was excited. I was coming into the home stretch of editing it and my hard drive crashed. We're out here on the road. I don't have any of my equipment with me. The good news is most of it was backed up or you know I've been able to recover what wasn't backed up, but it was a setback and I'm not going to be finishing that video this weekend, but I wanted to put something out. It's been a while. So all that being said, hi, I'm American Johnson and I am sick of being right all the time. <laughs> okay, I suppose that sounds a smidge immodest. So allow me to rephrase, I'm tired of us being right all the time. And by us, of course, I mean communists and anarchists anti-capitalists, frondeurs, seditious malcontents, bolshies, pinkos, reds. You know, I just realized there's not really a lot of insults for anarchists. Those are all insults for like, more like Marxist-Leninists. Where are all the insults for anarchists? All I could find on Google was bomb thrower. That's from like the turn of the last century. We don't even throw bombs anymore. Come up with some insults for some anarchists already. Get the lead out. Anyway, like I was saying, we on the left have a strong track record when it comes to dropping hot takes that age like fine wine. And that's almost never a good thing because what we are extremely good at is seeing how the social and political systems that currently have all the power in our world suck and kill a lot of people and, you know, oppress us. It actually sucks being right all the time when you're mostly pointing out how much suffering and death there's going to be if we don't end capitalism. And capitalism just keeps not ending. Marx and Engels, for instance, predicted the ways in which capitalism would continue to develop so that wealth would fall into fewer and fewer hands and instability would continue to precipitate with crisis after crisis. In the 19th century, W.E.B. Du Bois, and yes, it's pronounced Du Bois. That's the way he said his own name. Du Bois predicted the rise of the carceral state and the ways in which chattel slavery would give way to prison slavery to keep black Americans oppressed and in servitude. In 1914, Rudolf Rocker predicted that the First World War would be a period of mass murder such as the world has never known before, when most people at that time believed it would be a short and insignificant affair that would be over by Christmas. In June 1940, Ho Chi Minh predicted the outcome of World War II, writing, the day Hitler attacks the Soviet Union will be the Armageddon of the German fascist. It is quite certain that if the first imperialist war resulted in the establishment of the Soviet Union, then the collapse of fascism will lead to the victory of socialist revolutions in many other countries. And guess what? That's what happened. Listening to black revolutionists like Angela Davis and Fred Hampton speaking way back in the 60s and 70s, you'd almost think that they must have traveled back in time from the present day because they discussed the issues of the police, prison, and capitalism in amazingly prescient ways. There are a number of ways in which I would describe what a political prisoner is. Of course, we all recognize that the United States does not recognize the existence of political prisoners. And in fact, uh, in general, when you talk about a person who is arrested uh, for political reasons, you're talking about the use of criminal charges in order to... Uh, uh, stifle leadership in order to isolate uh, leaders and, and activists from the community. There is that kind of political prisoner. We know about Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins and Huey Newton and Leotis Johnson, and I could go on and on and on. The list is endless. The Soledad brothers. Uh, we know that uh, they were uh, arrested on criminal charges as an excuse for removing them from the community, removing them from their revolutionary uh, work and activity among the people. But over the last few years, there has come into being another kind of political prisoner. And I'm talking about all of the sisters and brothers who are victims of the system, who are easy targets of the police, who get railroaded through the courts into prison often for no reason at all, uh, who are there only because they're black. And I think uh, a brother 
during the Attica Rebellion sort of uh, expressed this whole thing when uh, he was asked by a reporter um, what he was charged with. And he said he was charged with being black. That's why he was there. Why do I have a lot of arrests because of harassment? Why is that harassment? Because the people that harass me have set up a problem that made me disagree with them violently. And, and they, they set up this problem in order to exploit me and other people like me. And why they want to get rid of me because I'm saying something that might wake up some other exploited people and some other oppressed people. And if all these people ever get together, then these pigs that are exploiting us, we'll be able to run them into the lake. That's why they want to get rid of us. And it's just, uh, it's sort of like a primary thing with me. I'm the, I'm the first move that they'll make. I'm a part of an organization that will be the first organization they'll move on because I happen to be a part of an organization, the Black Panther Party, that is the only organization, in fact, that has came out and stood up loud and clear and said that we don't care what anybody says, whether they have guns or not and badges or 18 uniforms, if whenever they step outside the bounds of legality into the bounds of illegality, then we'll blow their brains out if they're bothering the people. Right and what makes them mad about that? They're constantly bothering the people. Anybody that's out there for the protection of the people happens to be in direct conflict with them. What makes them mad about it? What makes them mad about it is that they have black people and white poor people and red poor people and Puerto Rican poor people and Latin American Puerto Rican people of uh, uh, poor people of all the sense they had them caught up in movements based on racism when the Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire best, we think you fight fire with water best. We're gonna fight racism, not with racism, but we're gonna fight with solidarity. We said we're not gonna fight capitalism with black capitalism, but we're going to fight it with socialism. We stood up and said we're not going to fight reactionary pigs and reactionary state attorneys like this and reactionary state attorneys like Hammerhand with any other reactions on our part. We're going to fight their reactions with all of those people to get together and have an international proletarian revolution. Slavoj Zizek, writing at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020, predicted how things would play out in the United States during the pandemic, predicting that the far right would deeply mistrust any state actions to stop the disease. He wrote, <clears throat> Okay, let me get this. Why did I decide to film this video on a mountainside? Zizek wrote, it's not hard to imagine the large bands. Okay, I'm not going to do the Zizek voice. It's not hard to imagine that large bands of libertarians bearing arms and suspecting that the quarantine was a state conspiracy would attempt to fight their way out. As the worldwide epidemic develops, we need to be aware that market mechanisms will not be enough to prevent chaos and hunger. <sighs> The air is very thin up here. Measures that appear to most of us today as communist will have to be considered. And remember, Zizek wrote this before the massive anti-quarantine riots, which saw Trump supporters brandishing guns at state capitol buildings, and before a Republican-controlled government issued cash payments directly to every United States citizen. My partner, Luna, also made some stark predictions about the pandemic early on. She was urging our audience to wear masks and take the virus seriously as early as December of 2019. She convinced me early on that the virus would become a global catastrophe and that the United States and other capitalist nations would not be capable of handling the situation, which is why we both made so many urgent videos back during that time trying to get the story out about the ways in which Vietnam, this country I'm in right now, was successfully handling the situation as early as March 16th, 2020. We left this in general saw what was coming with COVID well before our liberal and fascist counterparts. And for our part, Luna and I felt like a couple of regular chicken littles back in the early 2020 with countless liberals choking up our comment sections telling us that we were being alarmist and ridiculous for encouraging mask wearing and imploring our audience to prepare for the worst. We in the left also predicted the disproportionate impact COVID-19 would have on minority communities and the disabled. We knew that the death toll would be much higher, and we knew that there would be programs of intentional neglect and eugenicist genocide. And unfortunately, we have been shockingly correct, as we now see that around 50% of deaths of COVID-19 
Uh, we're in the disabled community in many places. We know that black life expectancies in the USA have dropped by three years. Latino Americans have lost two years on their life expectancy. And the startling revelations made by Prolcult in their documentary about the eugenicist policies in the UK have also proven far too accurate. If you watch a lot of videos from socialists and communists from years ago, you'll see that they've mostly aged pretty well. Sean and Thought Slime, Econ NB, Nina Illingworth, Bo of the Fifth Column, and Innuendo Studios have all spoken about fascism in ways which today seem stunningly ahead of their time. And if I may say so myself, I think my videos on stochastic terrorism also hold up pretty well a couple of years later. And liberals may have been caught off guard by the storming of the Capitol building in Washington, but leftists certainly were not. And there's a reason most anti-fascists are communists and anarchists, and there's a reason anti-fascists are <laughs> anti-fascists. It's because we know exactly what fascists are capable of, and we're not at all surprised whenever fascists do a fascism. And speaking of liberals, we've got them clocked as well. Soft Boy Social Club and John the Duncan and Professor Cornell West have made predictions about the neoliberal tendencies of Joe Biden, which are already proving to be eerily prescient. Many of us have also been discussing the harsh reality of global climate change, which is becoming increasingly relevant as ice storms in Texas and horrifying wildfires in Australia and the USA's West Coast and devastating hurricanes and floods and so many other weather disasters ravage our already overburdened infrastructures, which have been so neglected in this late stage of capitalism. There's so many chickens. But only leftists have been honest enough to unflinchingly admit that plans like the Green New Deal, the Paris Agreement, and the Great Reset will do precious little to stem the tide of climate catastrophe, and that capitalism will be incapable of dealing with the devastation that is to come. Now, I was treated like an asshole along with my fellow leftists when we all said that Trump was trying to pave the way for some kind of a coup in his creepy, weird election night speech. Liberals said we were being alarmist, we were not reading the situation properly, but that's exactly what ended up happening. I know that we were treated like assholes anytime we've said that this pandemic is going to lead to another depression level catastrophe for all of society in the developed capitalist world. But now we have police in Portland attacking people for trying to take food out of a dumpster, which sounds to me like something out of a friggin' Steinbeck novel. Now, look, don't get me wrong, we on the left are not right all the time about everything. I've made videos myself about how I didn't see things coming, like for instance, the Black Lives Matter uprising, and I'm in pretty good company in not being able to 100% see the future. That dog scared me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Marx <laughs> did not see the role that fascism would play in bolstering capitalism and turning the working class against itself in the 20th century. Lenin did not foresee the events which would lead to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Most anarchists and communists of the 19th century believed that capitalism would collapse under its own mounting contradictions in relatively short order, and that sadly did not happen. And if you've ever spent any time at all around leftists, you'll know that we all vehemently disagree with each other about what seems like everything. But in general, I gotta say, we have been pretty good when it comes to identifying and predicting the path humanity would take. We have demonstrated a fairly miraculous, if I don't mind saying so, understanding of oppression and the ways in which oppressive forces and institutions develop. We have correctly sounded the alarm time and time again as crises have engulfed the world and oppressive capitalist imperialist institutions have subjugated pretty much everyone pretty much everywhere. We've certainly been better political psychics than neoliberals who predicted throughout the 20th century that austerity and free markets and forcing values of individualism and personal responsibility onto a suffering working class would lead to prosperity and peace, only to plunge the entire world into chaos, privation, suffering, and instability. You sort of got that one wrong, neoliberals. We've certainly done better than the far right, who have only brought suffering and devastation and murder wherever they've taken power, from Hitler and Mussolini to Trump and Bolsonaro. And the reason that we leftists are so much dang better at analyzing and understanding the modern world is that we analyze society systemically. 
anarchist hierarchy analysis, communist class analysis, intersectionalist analysis of interlocking forms of oppression, including race, dialectical materialist analysis of processes of change and conflicting forces. These are all tools and methodologies which enable us to see how systems develop and shape our lives. Liberals, on the other hand, love to individualize politics. Liberals love to see Trump and his supporters as a collection of individuals who are mentally ill or mentally deficient. Trump supporters are crazy and stupid in the eyes of liberals, and they love pop psychologists like Bandy X. Lee, who dismisses fascism as a set of psychiatric disorders, and countless articles and videos from centrists and liberals talk about the differences between the left and the right brains, whatever that means. And of course, there's that neoliberal obsession with personal responsibility, which we talked about earlier. To the liberal, the path forward is individual lifestyleism. If we all recycle and buy electric cars, we can stop climate change. If we all just vote for Joe Biden and the Democrats, we can destroy fascism. If we all buy fair trade coffee from Starbucks, then global imperialism will cease to be a problem. It's this kind of mindset that leads someone like Joe Biden to proclaim that healthcare is a right for all while simultaneously opposing universal healthcare. Now, obviously, individuals do have some impact on our world. Our individual identities and characteristics certainly impact our experiences in the world. My disabilities and my race, my gender identity certainly have had impact on my life. It's certainly true that Donald Trump's personal psychology has had some impact during his tenure as president. That's not really something I could deny. But Trump himself is really, as we leftists understand, just a single phenomenon, a single symptom of a deeply rooted system of interlocking oppressions and power dynamics, systems. And if Trump were never born, these systems would still be oppressing and neglecting and murdering just as they are, just as they did before he took office, and just as they will continue to do under Joe Biden. <sighs> Motherfucker. When it comes to systemic analysis, liberals simply think the systems we have in place are pretty much fine. Bourgeois democracies are pretty much okay. They just need a little tweaking here and there. This is why the Biden-Harris administration responds to genocidal police and prison violence that goes back centuries against black people and which is rooted in slave catching by offering cops 300 million more dollars. It's why instead of dismantling ICE concentration camps or our foreign drone terror programs, which he helped build, Biden is instituting reforms to those institutions, which make for pretty good headlines, but allow abuse and murder to continue systemically. Oh, and hey, look, I just checked the news and oh, we're invading Iraq again. What a fucking surprise. I guess if there's one form of systemic analysis that liberals have, it's their bourgeois economics. But even bourgeois economics are grounded in some pretty absurd concepts about the individual and in a sense, they're getting worse. The current prevailing school of economics among liberals is behavioral economics, which is pretty much everything we've been talking about when it comes to the liberal conception of the individual and the world. It's all about analyzing individual behavior and psychology and brains. And if anything, this has made economics even more centered on the individual than classical bourgeois economics. So no joy there. Bourgeois economical analysis seems to be sucking more, not less, over time when it comes to systemic analysis. Now, if there's one thing liberals love to brag about, it's being better than fascists. Side note, it's a little sad and hilarious how proud liberals are that they're better than fascists. Isn't that like the lowest bar? I do have to admit they are right because while liberals might be wrong about pretty much everything, at least they don't earnestly believe that 5G towers are a Chinese plot to spread COVID, which is simultaneously a secret communist plot to destroy the world and a fake disease that doesn't actually kill anyone. I mean, do I really have to address fascist political analysis? What do you want me to say? They're a bunch of terrified dinglings. But I do think it's worth looking at fascist analysis for at least one reason, because they do employ a sort of corrupt, bizarro systemic analysis and I think it's an important cautionary tale for leftists. You see, fascists also see the world as a maelstrom of conflicting forces in a way that kinda sorta, if you squint, looks a bit like the way leftists see the world. But holy God, is it not how we leftists see the world? And that's because fascists put all their stock in systems that exist only in the fascist imagination. They see things like race conflict and conflict between their traditional norms and values and outsiders as the driving social forces. There's no basis in material reality 
at all. It's all just pure idealistic garbage built on pseudoscience, chauvinism, and fear. And that's what makes material analysis so important for leftists. Because if we're not careful, if we don't ground our principles in material fact and accurate observation of the world around us, if we allow chauvinism and idealism to invade our movement, then we are in danger of going off the rails ourselves. And sadly, this can and does occur, as I've discussed in my videos on reactionary leftists and dogmatism. So take my prescription. Don't fall prey to idealism and chauvinism. That sort of rhymed. Okay, we'll workshop that slogan. Anyway, like I said at the beginning of the video, uh, there's a lot more to be said here, and way more examples of leftists who have made bold predictions which have turned out to be scary true. In fact, if you know of any, why don't you share some links and examples in the comments below? I love me some finely aged systemic analysis. That's it for this video. Abrupt ending.